Hey everyone, welcome to another A Healthy New Zealand podcast. And today I am really thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Pran Yoganathan. So Dr. Pran is a gastroenterologist and he did his initial training at Otago University in New Zealand. So kind of feels like one of the family really. Dr. Pran has a huge interest in nutrition and also evolution and particularly about how we can use food as medicine. So I have a ton of questions for him today. And a lot of those are around the kinds of problems I see my clients struggle with. So this is going to be a great learning for me as well. And I hope this podcast will be really useful for everyone. So welcome, Dr. Pran. And I really appreciate you putting time aside to talk to me today. Thank you, Susan. It's, um, it, it's, it, it'll be a pleasure to chat to you and uh, appreciate the uh, invite to come on your show to talk. Thank you. So would you start off just by giving us a bit of background about who you are and you know, how you got into doing what you're doing? Uh, not a problem, Susan. So I, um, I, I'm, I'm originally from the country of Sri Lanka. Um, but uh, left that country very early, um, obviously in relation to civil war. This was in sort of the late 80s. So I was just a child when I left. Um, and uh, my father, who had a very adventurous spirit um, in retrospect, I think, uh, we, we traveled a lot through Africa and he, you know, he worked as a dentist there, um, many, many remote sites. And so I kind of um, got to got to spend a lot of time in, in a, on a continent which which basically gave rise to humanity, sort of the cradle of humanity, so to speak. And, um, you know, it really ignited my passion for where we came from and, and what we as humans are kind of um, um, evolved to do. Africa really is a magnificent uh, continent and uh, unfortunately sometimes the political issues overshadow what what truly is a um, uh, it's a, a truly amazing continent with amazing people so uh, that, that was a big part of who I am today I think and you know when we um, moved to New Zealand I would have been about 13 years of age or we, we, we would have been one of the first uh, ethnic uh, families in, in Otago and, um, you know, we were welcomed with open arms and uh, did my schooling at Otago Boys High School, um, fond memories there and, and then subsequently university in, um, you know, Otago University where I did my medical degree. I was a, you know, very young um, doctor. I, I was done by the time I think I was about 21. Um, when, when I finished my degree, having entered medicine pretty early on, um, at a very early age, very immature, I, I, I suspect, and I uh, just couldn't wait to get out of New Zealand. It, it kind of, um, it, it'll get out of Otago, becomes a very small place. And having grown up there, I thought I'd travel around Australia. And um, here I am now, 20 years on in Australia, I haven't left. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, having met an Australian woman, I... Um, got married here I've got three young kids and uh, but still a lot of fond memories of, of New Zealand and um, you know I uh, really appreciated um, um, the upbringing there and, and the culture there so um, that's a little bit about myself and you know when I was here in Australia I pursued my basic physician training uh, subsequent advanced training in gastroenterology and uh, I'm now a gastroenterologist, having been uh, practicing as, as a specialist in the community for uh, close to 10 years now. Oh, wow. Oh, great story. Do you ever get back, back to New Zealand? Do you, have you still got family here? Or? When my parents were there, uh, my father was a, 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 a lecturer at the University of Otago as a dentist. And um, when they were there, I, I did travel back a fair bit. But... Um, since they've migrated, uh, we haven't been back. Although we've got a lot of great friends um, there, uh, I, I, you know, I, once the borders open up again, hopefully we'll be making our way back there. You know. <laughs> oh well, I hope that. Um, well, we, you know, hope you know, New Zealand gave you this great sort of underpinning of your future career. So, so it's kind of quite quite cool that we've that you came from here, I think. I'm very proud of it. it the university, um, you know, no offence to any Australian university, is just a, it's a different level. Um, it's just a different level of class. And, um, you know, I, I'm very proud to say that I trained at the University of Otago. Oh, 
Thank you. Well, to get this little chat, or get the ball rolling with our little chat, I was wondering if we could start at the beginning and maybe talk a little bit about digestion, the digestive process, and ancestrally how we evolved, how our gastro, um, you know, gastric system evolved. Um, and I know that's a particular interest of yours, so I'd be really keen to hear you speak about that. Yeah, not a, not a problem, uh, Susan. I mean, a lot of kind of what I've learned over the years is, is really just the kind of uh, through osmosis, learning from others and, and just a lot of reading. I think medicine's a very interesting field. And, you know, I kind of spent a lot of years in university and then as subsequently as a doctor, just sort of pondering why it is that, that we don't really discuss how disease occurs in the first place. I mean, we get down to the molecular basis of why it occurs, you know, which cells mediate disease and so forth but why does disease occur in the first place that medicine really doesn't get into that and I, I think it's fairly common knowledge that lifestyle illnesses that we face in the modern world you know such as obesity diabetes alzheimer's and many more gout and, and so the list goes on uh, are really driven by the environment and so it, it's really stuck with me that we're fundamentally when we medicate something or operate on something we're basically operating on diseases of the environment uh, that subsequently, you, you know, um, uh, cause, um, cause illness in, 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 in individuals. So it, it's fascinated me that we don't get taught on how to prevent illness. I mean, um, you know, cordially it's mentioned diet and exercise, but what does that actually entail? What does a diet um, that, that helps prevent illness entail? And what does exercise that help prevent illness and so we don't get to all that and um, that that's always kind of stuck stuck with me and and so I think in the last five years it's really been an, a a a, a, uh, a process of just learning and um, and I think I, I've got an understanding of what what that all entails now but I'm still learning and I, I try to remain humble because the human body is infinitely complex um, it's a colossal um, a system that 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 you know I don't think one person can truly understand, but we're starting to make inroads into um, how this how this bit of machinery works. Mm -hmm. And you know, to to go back to your question of well, what are we designed to do? I think that's the fundamental question. I, I, I've always said that that unless we kind of understand our past, it's really under, difficult to understand where we're actually going um, in, in mm -hmm. the future. And, and, and the past is super fascinating, you know, like we, we've got, we've got um, experts on the matter, um, you, you know, in the, in the study of human history, uh, deep human history, of course, um, uh, the paleontologists and so forth, that, that they'll, they'll tell us that, that we, we fundamentally uh, are an a, a ape-like creature 4.4 million years ago, um, you know, we share a common ancestor with the modern apes um, and and somehow our path diverged from them and what drove that it's fundamentally climate change uh, evolution is extremely chaotic it does not occur in a linear fashion it's extremely slow so it takes often millions of years to, to make vast changes but we, we're, we're in a species of ape that's really evolved quite rapidly what's driven that um, initially was climate changes as these savannas in Africa shrunk, these, sorry, um, rainforests in Africa, which, which was dense, lush rain, rainforests millions of years ago, as they shrunk because of climate change, we're fundamentally forced from, from our trees. Um, so this, you know, tree dwelling, fruit leaf eating ancestor is forced onto this savanna with many predators, um, essentially, you know, it's a, essentially become, it's a bottom feeder. And, and I think we spent many, many years of our life as scavengers, scavenging what we could. Um, uh, and, 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 and I think at some point we started adding in nutrient-dense foods such as bone marrow and, and uh, rotting meat into our diet. We, our digestive tract had to adapt to that. You know, if you're consuming high-risk foods like rotting meat, you need to have a decontamination process that occurs and that started occurring in our stomach, our, our pH uh, levels, which, which denote acidity, um, really show that we, we became quite acidic digesters. And, 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 and that was interesting. Um, and so that's part of, 
who we are. You know, when people talk about acidity, um, it's kind of made out to be a disease, but the reality is that's our birthright. That's how we, we evolved. Um, in addition, as, as, as these foods became more nutrient dense, our brain size started expanding quite significantly. And as we started employing methods other than scavenging, i.e. hunting, um, the brain size really grew. And so we've got this explosion in brain size, which is a perfect, which has been driven by a perfect combination of nutrient dense foods and the demand for it to grow because of uh, the requirement for hunting. Of course, once we started unlocking the secrets of fire and how to make it and cook it to then release more nutrient density, well, you know, then you see a real explosion in brain size. So we've gone through these many stages from, you know, Homo habilis, the tool maker, to Homo erectus, the apex predator, to then subsequently Homo sapiens, which is the modern humans as we see them today, 200,000 years old, not much older than that. So we're a very, very young species of hominid. Um, and uh, for, for most of that time, I think it'd be fair to say we spent it as an apex predator at the top of the food chain. But then, you know, 10,000 years ago, again, something dramatic occurs in the climate. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the precipitants for this might have been something called the Younger Dryas event, a massive comet strike over Greenland, which raised sea levels by many hundreds of meters, essentially causing huge, huge devastation globally. Um, and, and I think driven following that, we, we essentially, as large animals died out because of this climate change that followed that, we, we had to learn to adapt. And we're a very adaptable species. And I think this is where farming starts emerging about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting is we start developing salivary amylase amplification, um, which is basically a, a genetic you know, a sequence which starts amplifying in, in our DNA, which allows for better starch uh, breakdown. Um, and we start increasing our amylase content within the gut as well as we start um, consuming more starch rich foods and learning how to farm that. So it's really quite amazing how agriculture then drove some further uh, evolutionary adaptations. We developed things like lactase uh, permanence. We develop depigmentation in, in the um, you know in the populations in northern Europe, where as they went from organ-rich foods, which contain quite a lot of vitamin D, to grains, which fundamentally contain none, they had to learn to make vitamin D in their skin in a sun-poor environment. So depigmentation is a direct result um, of, of of farming, uh, which a lot of people don't know. You know, six thousand years ago, mm. the settlers, uh, the first settlers in Europe, were dark skin. You know, in, in Sweden, they had dark skin, light blue eyes and dark hair. Um, but then we start seeing these adaptations come and we, our jaw shrunk, um, our brain size has decreased. Mm. So one would have to say that agriculture drove some changes, but the changes may not necessarily have been um, positive. Um, and just, you know, to kind of end on this topic of our history and trying to condense of what is, you know, millions of years of adaptation and evolution um, you know, for the purposes of your question, but, you know, as, as farming allows us to settle, build civilization, fecundity increases, so the ability to have children quickly increases, so our population size booms. So, you know, we've got all this debate now, on is this um, all sustainable, um, you know, with the population boom, can we feed a population this big? The answer is no. Answer is it's pretty bloody difficult to do so because, uh, you know, we, we've put ourselves in this environment. So the argument would be that had we remained hunters and gatherers, nomadic, um, uh, I don't think we'd be seeing the issues that we see now. Of course, that would have been a harsh life. And, you know, I'm not trying to romanticise the life of a hunter-gatherer, but I am trying to say that we are a species that became far too smart for what nature intended. And I think um, this is part of the issue that we see now. Well, I think that's... That's a great explanation and summary there. I think people will appreciate that. We're seeing so many conflicts around food and nutrition and diet wars. And I think being able to put it into that context is so important. Thank you, Susan. Mm. And it's quite interesting you're talking about, you know, when we came out of the trees and started being scavengers and things like that. And I've got the APOE44 gene, which I believe is one of the original genes that was designed for a living in that life, you know, that, that scavenging 
life and eating rotten food and things like that. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Even, you know, let, let's even go back as far as 80, 90 years ago, where, you know, before the advent of refrigeration, the ability to have an acidic stomach would, would, would have been, you know, very, very advantageous. Of course, we live in this hygienic environment. We, we very rarely eat, con de you know, contaminated foods, thankfully. Um, and henceforth, there are these evolutionary mismatches that occur where we essentially got this hyperacidic stomach, but perhaps it's not, not as needed in the, in the modern world. And, and, and this is why we've got this epidemic of use of anti-acids and proton pump inhibitors, which are drugs essentially that, that, that increase your acidity, um, sorry, that in, increase your pH levels, which drops gastric acidity. But, but byproduct of all of that is, you know, to properly cleave protein and expose areas within our foods that, that allow it uh, to be better absorbed, you need to have a relatively acidic stomach. But the stomach's uh, function's twofold. It's to cleave protein, obviously, and break it down. And the second is to decontaminate. We, we don't need the decontamination apart as much. Mm. But we see so many people with things like GERD and, and you know, IBS and, and, you know, now, you know, SIBO's been hitting the headlines for a few years now. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the acidity of the stomach and in context of those kind of conditions? And is are they associated in any way? Is there yeah. some yeah. relationship between them? Yeah. Yeah, so SIBO is kind of really thrown out there as um, you know, like, a, like a disease state. But the reality of the situation is all that is doing is, is a breath test that picks up um, hydrogen in your, in, your, in your breath. So if you're creating hydrogen, it, means, it must mean that you're fermenting food. If you're fermenting food, it must mean that you're consuming excess amounts of fermentable carbohydrates. Um, which, which essentially means that your diet is ex extremely carbohydrate dense, and which links in with a very elegant hypothesis called the protein leverage hypothesis that suggests that if you're under eating protein, well, you're in trouble because you're going to end up overeating fat and carbohydrate. So I think we've got SIBO in these populations that are essentially consuming far too much fermentable carbohydrates in their diet. And these fermentable carbohydrates can be you know, lactose, it can be polyols, it can be fructans, it can be fructose, many, many of these sugars which make up the bulk of our food. So I struggle to see SIBO as a disease of, of that is, you know, innately tied in with, um, with, with being human. I see it more as a problem of the environment. It's, it's really quite an obvious, um, obvious label to give someone who's got gut distress. Um, GERD and uh, dyspepsia are quite interesting. Dyspepsia is essentially indigestion, which is different to gastroesophageal reflux, just the pain that people feel, and it's often called an ulcer pain, but the reality is ulcers are very, very uncommon in the modern age where proton pump inhibitors are, are quite, um, quite commonly used and employed. You can buy them over the counter here in Australia. I don't know what the situation in New Zealand is. But dyspepsia fundamentally is a problem with motility. It's, again, tied in with gas. If you've got increased intestinal gas, you've got impaired motility, and often these sort of individuals tend to demonstrate a lot more pain in their um, in their in their what they perceive to be the stomach. I think it is an issue to do with motility. They can't move things on again, probably to do with issues downstream in the colon where they're fermenting. Um, reflux is very interesting. I'm fascinated with reflux, and I'm pretty sure reflux is the inability to contain the acid that we're supposed to create in our stomach within the stomach. I think it leaks into the esophagus and that's a disease of muscle. One of your lower esophageal muscle, which is being relaxed excessively, which occurs again, if you've got fermentation downstream in the colon or distal small bowel. Also, it's a, it's a disease related to weakness of the diaphragm as we, we you know, our breathing um, techniques uh, or the, the method of breathing is, is so poor. In addition, we, we just, we're, we're a sarcopenic species. We're losing muscle um, mm. in early childhood. It, you know what I mean? So it's no surprise to me that the diaphragmatic muscle also is also being lost. Henceforth, we, we just have an inability to contain this acid within the stomach. It's leaking out into the esophagus. So blocking acid uh, by utilizing proton pump inhibitors, yes, will drop your acidity, but doesn't solve the issue. 
you're still regurgitating these contents up. It's just less acidic, so it's less symptomatic. It, it kind of just covers, um, it, it, it's a Band-Aid solution. Um, and I think there's a lot of good evidence for what I'm suggesting. It's just not very popular advice or popular um, popular um, uh, theory. Um, a lot of my colleagues have been quite upset with, um, with what I've proposed and, and the fact that I've stated that these proton pump inhibitors are utilised far too much. But... Um, you know, people don't like change and people kind of get stuck in their rut and doctors uh, by nature. We're very routine driven creatures, um, you know, so I can understand that. But, you know, the science doesn't lie. Um, so, you know, you've got to go with the science, um, even if it is unpopular. And what's the, what's the long term outcome of using proton pump inhibitors? I mean, I've seen all sorts of research connecting it to increased heart disease and diabetes and other chronic diseases. But what about just even from a nutrient, you know, cleaving those proteins off and a digest digestion and absorption process? Yeah, it can be great. Um, I think there's been vast meta-analyses done on, um, on, on, on all of this, um, uh, Susan. And the reality is they'll turn around and say, well, there's, these are the side effects, proposed side effects, but they're all very weak. Um, they're weakly designed studies and it's very difficult to separate all this out. And I'll give you my theory on it. There's no doubt that it increases your risk of gut-based infections. There's no doubt about that. I think the consensus on that is fairly clear. It makes sense. We've lost our first line of uh, defense, you know, as the acidity, um, um, acidity is right. Like it'll be very interesting to apply a PPI in a group of Africans living in a village where they're drinking contaminated water, it would be disastrous for those individuals. Mm. They, they mm. would die. Um, you'd see huge mortality rates. But we live in the privileged West, right? Like where we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, good point. Yeah. You know, mm. So, so that, that's number one. Number two, I think the fact that you require proton pump inhibition means that your lifestyle cannot be adequate. Henceforth, your risk of heart disease and diabetes and obesity and osteoporosis, all of these things go up. So it's very difficult to separate cause and effect. So do proton pump inhibitors cause thin bones? Unlikely, but they're associated with what causes thin bones, probably a poor diet and poor lifestyle, lack mm. of exercise. Mm. And if you're that way inclined, well, you're more likely to be eating rubbish and, and, and overweight. And we know obesity is a risk factor for reflux, makes sense you've got a whole lot of fat packed away into a tiny intra-abdominal cavity with uh, a diseased muscle, diaphragm, and lower esophageal sphincter that cannot hold on to the acid. It's like a suitcase that's overpacked. I mean, it's no, no surprise mm -hmm. to me that we, we suffer reflux. It's very difficult to uh, see someone with good diaphragmatic strength, with good diet, and um, who does not carry much visceral fat. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to, to get reflux in that place. It can happen, but often it tends to be due to disease, low esophageal sphincter for whatever reason, um, or just congenitally a, a very, very lax low esophageal sphincter. But the vast majority are metabolically unhealthy people. This is, these are the people that really develop reflux. Mm. What's your thoughts about all this kind of testing that we do? I you know, I've, I've learned a lot about doing the testing and I used to do it a bit in my own practice, but I came to the conclusion that it wasn't really based on strong evidence. And we have all these darn protocols that we learn and then we're supposed to give to all our clients and people with serious issues, those protocols don't work, you know, and I speak up about that now and and. I'm not. A, I'm personally not a huge fan of SIBO testing. Um, I, I'd really like your thoughts on that. I'm pretty simple sort of a guy, Susan. I'm, I'm a. I'm, I'm very. You know, the less is more sort of an approach. Really, when I when I sort of break down my personality, um, I, I think we just overcomplicate diet and we overcomplicate investigation. But I think. Um, the vast majority of people kind of really are confused as to how to do it. And, um, and I think, I don't, I mean, not to be critical against my own profession, but I am, I am deeply critical and, and cynical about how we've ended up here. And, and I think we overcomplicate things. The, the solution really is quite simple. 
However, to implement such a solution is very difficult to do in an environment that we've created for ourselves, which is one that's based on being sedentary. Uh, we, we're innately a lazy species. You, you know, if you take a hunter-gatherer and give them flour, wheat, um, sugar, and vegetable oils, they too will not hunt. They, they'll, they'll, they'll choose not to because it's easier, right? And, and we, uh, we've been built in an environment where we were designed to conserve as much energy as possible. We, we're an energy hungry species. And, and so we can't, if we can't recognize, recognize these aspects about ourselves, we won't be able to reconcile what, what is occurring. So uh, I think uh, to simplify it is the way to do it. And, and a lot of these protocols are just excessively complicated. I'll look at them and it kind of just gives me a headache. So I'll just put them aside and, 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 and move on. I think um, a lot of tests are overdone. I think we are over servicing with endoscopy, colonoscopies, these are all things that incentivize the operator to do it. I mean, we get paid on these um, on procedure, basically, a lot of us do, especially out in private practice. So obviously the temptation is there to, to just over-service someone who may not necessarily need all of this. So um, I, I think there's plenty of investigations being done. I think there's good data to say that there's too many investigations being done. You know? mm. So what would your... What would a key takeaway be to people who are listening? So a very typical of my clients, they come with bloating, reflux, uh, maybe constipation, maybe diarrhea, fatigue, brain fog. What what would be your recommendations? I mean, that's a fairly classic sort of yeah, yeah. Hi some, symptom history. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of these people will be following the food pyramid, which suggests a carbohydrate-based diet, which makes up maybe 85% of their macronutrient distribution with a low protein percentage in a very low fat diet. Um, you, you know, so the other flip side of that is the standard Western diet, which is high fat, high carbohydrate, low protein. But the common denominator there is low protein. So once you can teach people to ramp up protein, they're just consuming less of the other stuff. You know, I think there's a big movement with the low carb uh, world where there's this push for excessive amount of fat, eat fat, mm -hmm. cream, eat butter, yeah. eat this and eat bacon. I, I disagree with that. I think, I think you know, the key step is protein. Protein is non-negotiable. Uh, this is my, one of my lead dietitians, um, Jessica Turton, who works uh, with, with me at the Centre of Gastrointestinal Health, she's a brilliant lady, and, and, and she she makes a statement or she tells a patient's statement which is protein is non-negotiable i love that and i think mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. it's essentially a building block it basically will bring with it a lot of micronutrients and and the fat you know mm -hmm. so if you're eating a bit of steak or a salmon there is micronutrients galore in that in addition there is plenty of saturated and polyunsaturated fat which our body does need now the flip side to that is, well, protein can be obtained from vegetables. If they can, it can, but it's an inferior source. Um, the leucine content, which um, helps from a muscle synthesis is, is, or muscle protein synthesis, is pretty low, um, unless you're going for something like soy, but then soy, well, you know, there's a lot of controversy about soy given the phytoestrogen content. In addition, a lot of this protein is locked up in a fibrous matrix. There's a lot of anti-nutrients, tannins, um, you know, phytotoxins. There's just there's just so much baggage, lectins. And so there's so much baggage with, with plant-based protein. And it's not particularly natural for us um, to be able to extract that level of, it was just an extra level of difficulty for the digestive system. Mm. It's quite interesting, like with, with animal-based protein, you essentially absorb it in your small gut, in your small bowel. It's called proteolytic digestion, which is using enzymes basically to break it down. And then they're absorbed through the intestinal brush border into the cells and then distributed to the body with plant protein because they're locked away. A lot of that ends up in the colon. And so protein in the colon is broken down through putrefactive digestion. That's a disaster because the protein, um, when it's in the colon, um, it brings on the putrefactive bacteria, which is which has been linked to a very, very adverse or a negative gut-based gut signature when you measure the microbe. Oh, well, when you when you separate out the microbiome so it's quite interesting I, I think meat's been linked with a bad microbiome uh, signature but the reality is 40 to 50 percent of our meats are made through you know, burgers and pizzas and mm. 
nuggets, which are yeah. incredible. You know what I mean? It's not, they're not talking about a grass fed from a steak, which no. is eaten with salt, which is quite easy for our body to absorb. In addition, it provides us with that one component or the most important word in, in diet, which is satiety. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, look, I think for most people who suffer in gut distress, metabolic health, which is poor, all linked in together, really, these are all one big disease. Um, and, and I think for them, dialing up their quality protein, meat, fish, and eggs, right, um, to at least 50 to 60% of their diet, it doesn't even need to be that high. It can be 30%. A lot of people are consuming protein, animal protein, at 10 to 15%, like you look in America. The animal protein intake is 10%. Vast majority of their of their um, protein comes from plant protein, so they're made out to be big meat eaters, but they're really not. They're, they're mm. big meat eaters, and so as a result, these people unfortunately will crave energy in terms of fat and carbohydrate. So that you know, this is no no surprise to me that they're they've got such high obesity rates because of their meat intake is abysmally low. So I think uh, Australia and New Zealand are heading down that pathway and as we become more plant-based. I think we've um, got no issue with the whole plant-based um, movement, but there are big, big, big issues behind it from a physiological and uh, health-based perspective. Mm. Yes, and the other problem that comes with trying to get your protein from plants, you know, you, you mentioned all the, the um, digestive issues and locked up in fiber and all the anti-nutrients but it also comes with an enormous calorie load you know to get that 2.5 or 3 grams of leucine that you need each time you eat to trigger muscle protein synthesis comes with you know you know three or four cups of tofu or you know I forget how many kgs of quinoa you need to eat yeah, absolutely. Not to mention the uh, non-absorbable carbohydrates that, that have then mm. entered in mm. uh, to create methane, hydrogen, nitrogen, mm. all these gases which then trigger motility issues. Like, you know, it's not uncommon to see someone who's very heavily plant-based with a lot of gut distress. That's even a lot, you know, um, you know d trying to save the planet, um, but unfortunately at the expense of, of, of their body. I mean, feel sorry for a lot of these people because they essentially they've been kind of led to believe um, by the media and celebrities and you know health bodies pushing mm. the public's agenda that, that, that they're doing something positive but the reality is well, they're sitting in a gastroenterologist's office telling them about um, the gut distress um, their gut distress so there's this high level of cognitive dissonance that, that goes on um, which i find difficult to contend sometimes but it's this re-education process and i think most people keen to learn whether they can implement it or not, it's a different story. Yeah, and that is that's another topic altogether. So yeah. that brings there's kind of two things in there. So one of the things I hear a lot from people is they're really concerned about giving up their vegetables. Yeah. You know, and if I suggest they go on sort of an animal food diet for a while to just try and you know recover and restore, they get really like, uh, I don't want to give up my vegetables. What about my nutrients? So there's a huge lack of understanding about the nutrient density of animal foods. And then the other thing is we have this huge push for detox thing, you know, have all these juices and things and we all need to be detoxing our livers and, you know, our whole system. Love to hear your thoughts. Uh, absolutely, Susan. You know, like there's a lot of diets, a lot of fad diets um, around and I, I tend to... I tend not to, you know, buy into any of them really. Detox, juice diets, um, kale smoothies, all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, I hate to think of the oxalate load delivered uh, with 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 um, you know kale smoothies every day. Um, but you're right. Like we, as a species, we've been indoctrinated over these last thirty to forty years, maybe even longer, to believe that that meat's the enemy. You know what I mean? So I can understand why these people are so reluctant. It's like walking into a religious institution and and, and telling them to do something else, you know, go out and believe something else. And yeah. so it, it's, it becomes a very, very difficult conversation to have. So uh, one that I used to do with my clients, with my patients, but I don't do it anymore as much because it just, it's, 
it, it, it breaks me. Um, it breaks my spirit because it's just so difficult to achieve. I'm a, I'm a doctor. I deal with disease. I, it's very difficult to break all that down. I try and do it with, with most people that are interested. But luckily, I work with a team of four brilliant dietitians all on the same page as me. Um, and um, we work through Eclipse Health, uh, led by Jessica Turpin, who's, the, um, who's our lead nutritionist. And, and I, I basically, I have to divide and conquer. Do you know what I mean? I, I rule out the disease mm -hmm. aspect of it to make sure that there's no cancer or no inflammatory disease behind their gut issues. And then we've got this great team behind us, which really helps. Um, mm -hmm. It's really a process of unlearning for these people. And uh, very few can actually do it. I think maybe of 100 people that we see, 25% are able to take on that um, take on that advice. Um, and then on top of that, they go back and report to their general practitioners and say, "Well, this is a crazy diet. Protein of 50%. You got to be joking. Mm -hmm. You can die the heart attack." So, um, or they show their family members or, or whatever it is. And and so there's so many factors stacked up against us. But I think social media has been brilliant. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily like getting on mediums like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook and posting blogs on that, but I do it um, because one, it's allowed me to meet wonderful people like yourself. Um, we were, uh, you know, we were introduced initially through that social media platform. Um, in addition, you just reach people who then can read this in their own time. I'm, I'm naturally a very introverted person. This is all. Um, deeply draining for me to do all that sort of stuff, but I, but I do it because I feel a sense of responsibility because I do feel that we're doing it for in medicine and healthcare. I think we should be doing better. Mm. I agree, and I think there's just so much misinformation out there, and it's really challenging to deal with that and 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 provide an alternative view, which is why I'm so grateful that you're here today because you come with a huge amount of authority behind that view. So that's, you know, that's really, really helpful, I think. Thank you, Susan. I, I, again, you know, it's not without concern. I mean, I wonder about how my colleagues will react to this. I wonder about, you know, the governing bodies that, that dictate mm. our license yep. and so forth. But the beauty is there's now evidence. And I, all I do is talk in, in terms of evidence. Um, mm. Today, you know, I pushed out something about you know, how vegan diets on a Cochrane data, a Cochrane analysis uh, published just literally weeks ago shows there's no, no benefit mm. to for cardiovascular endpoints, primary or secondary. Mm. A couple of years before, Mediterranean diet found to be of no benefit for mm. secondary. Mm. So the reality is I'm just pushing out information and trying to incentivize thought. And, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm wrapped on the knuckles for that, well, so be it. But um, that would be a highly authoritarian uh, sort of a regime that, that 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 can pull that off, and so unfortunately we'll be losing freedom for an expression if that's occurring. Mm. And you've been joined by a lot of colleagues now. You know, we've got um, Professor, you know, Professor Noakes. We've got Gary Fitte in in Australia, and we've got various other people who have had that happen to them with their medical careers. But there is now becoming a very strong community of practicing doctors, specialists like yourself, cardiologists, lipidologists, all getting behind the same message. So for people like me, that's really, that gives us a lot of hope that it will start to disseminate out into the medical profession. Um, albeit slowly, I think it's, it's going to be yeah. a gradual process and may take their care mm. and kind of unlearn. And mm. um, I don't think that the guidelines will change anytime soon in terms of uh, recognizing sugar and, and refined fats as, as a source of issue. Um, I, don't, mm. I don't think that's going to occur anytime soon at all, you know, because given that the industry um, industry is massive, you know, when you talk mm. about money generated. Uh, talking about some very powerful systems in place yeah and i think the refined fats appear to me to be as problematic as the sugars to be really honest if, if it, not more so you know absolutely absolutely yeah. and this is why like uh, i'm always cautious in recommending people liquefying butter and drinking in you know mm. uh, or, or you know vegetable oils 
all this sort of stuff. I mean, fundamentally, these things will drive insulin resistance and if consumed in high enough levels. And, you know, this is why a lot of people will plateau on a ketogenic diet uh, because mm. they don't consume fat. Um, so the, the reality is unless you've got the activity levels to burn energy, carbohydrate or fat, you've got to be very cautious. Vegetable oils, which are rich in lemaloic acid, that's a different story. They probably stuff up mitochondrial health. Um, mitochondria is the, um, the powerhouse of every cell in our body. Um, and uh, they probably cause what's called reactive oxygen species, which are basically free radicals that are aging the cell inside out. And, and, and so it's not just calories, it's the quality of the calories. There's mm. much more to their story than meets the eye. So that's so why I kind of disagree with a lot of dietitians or exercise gurus that preach the calorie in, calorie out model. I mean, you could you know, have a packet of Twinkies and as long as you're within your calorie, um, intake for the day you'll be fine yes that may work if you if you've got good quality muscle and good exercise levels but the reality is it, it takes out of the equation of quality of the calories and the actual mm -hmm. intrinsic um, effects that it has on the human cells and so um, I think I think you know that that's a very important point I think that calorie in calorie out model to me has been an abysmal failure Mm. And I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding, you know, younger people, there's a huge hormonal input into growth and development and maintaining muscle mass. But certainly as we get older, the nutrient density of our food is absolutely, absolutely essential. And we can't really afford to have excess calories that are just empty, empty calories of energy without bringing us nutrients like the protein does. Yeah, absolutely. You know, amino acids, essential. Our brain senses that deep within the uh, cortical pathways, midbrain actually, probably hypothalamic. Uh, there are sensing pathways that plays that all sense whether there's nutrients there, and 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 so micronutrients as well, and minerals. The, the, these are the critical things. Um, you know, if, so the problem is like a, a packet of chips or a bowl of rice or a bowl of pasta. That there is very little nutrient value to it so the brain just doesn't recognize it a bit as anything of value it may temporarily satiate you um, but it's a temporary thing and this is why people are sort of raiding their cupboards after dinner if they're mm. such nutrient poor foods constantly snacking pushing up their insulin and so you know insulin's painted as this bad guy and they say well carbohydrates raise insulin the reality is it's not Carbohydrate, carbohydrates directly raising insulin. It's the fact that the area under the curve for the insulin secreted in the course of the day is so high, driven by mm. prostatitis, people are chronically eating. And mm. you ask people, do you snack? Well, no, I don't snack, but they've knocked off a you know, latte or something like this, mm. Mm. 200 calories. So they're just chronically eating because their brain simply doesn't recognize any of what they've eaten as anything of nutrient value. Mm. And that's what you were talking about earlier when you were talking about the protein leverage theory, wasn't it? Was that if we don't get, if our body senses it's not getting enough protein, it's just going to drive you to just keep on eating until you actually consume enough protein. Yeah, yeah, fundamentally. I mean, we, we think we're fairly special as a, as a species, but we're not. We're just another species of animal. And there are some very deep pathways that, that, that are hidden within the brain, which are essentially driven by instinct. We don't necessarily think of it. We've got to recognize instinctive behaviors, even as an instinctive behavior. It's not a pleasure behavior, it's an instinctive behavior. We've just linked eating to pleasure. Reality, the situation is we, we're a species driven to eat because we simply, our brains simply are not recognizing nutrients. And, and, and the, the issue with vegetables in the last 15, 60 years, the nutrient value has dropped off because of the modern farming methods and the new genetic breeds of crop um, in addition to the types of fertilizers employed the soil health because of mass production genetic modification these are all important factors so a broccoli 60 years ago um, is different to a broccoli now and i can confidently say that that is um, there are some good clinical studies to show this so um, we we really exist in an environment where the nutrient value of our food is dropping so which is a problem cattle and, and, and chicken and pork, which are then heavily grain fed, which then mm. accumulate lemaloic acid and more fat than they do protein. Mm. 
you know, again, you're looking at the same issue. So this is why I tend to push this idea of eat animals that are supposed to eat what they're supposed to eat, um, mm. to, to to allow for a healthy body. Mm. Very difficult to do with because you know economic constraints can can kind of you know play into that because it is, it is expensive to uh, consume more protein. But the beauty of it is you're eating what's eating mm. fat when you're yeah. um, eating protein, so uh, that kind of offsets the cost aspect of it, I suppose. And I think there are ways of eating protein. You know, ground ground beef is is a reasonably well priced protein, and you can feed a family you know, quite well with some ground beef and you can look at it price per meal and I don't think it's all that excessive really and it's cheaper than the health costs and it's cheaper than buying the supplements that you buy then to try and fill those nutrient um, requirements in your diet. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We're, We're a species built for scarcity. We're not a species built for choice. We've just got Mm. It's of choice and, and you know and kind of that that can um you know confuse a lot of people mm. who are very mm. simple at the end of the day like i think it's important to remember that we evolved in a culture um in in africa where we essentially ate fat uh, for energy and ate protein because it was non-negotiable mm. needed um our, most of our sugar actually came from protein through the process of gluconeogenesis you know we converted this excess protein 60 percent of it became sugar and we utilize that to stock up our liver and muscle glycogen. Uh, carbohydrates didn't exist. Um, you know, perhaps they would have consumed some tubers and things like that. But again, they weren't farmers. They would have just mm. foraged this mm. at, when, when desperate for roots, they would have got eaten and, you know, given the plant toxicity, they would have gotten sick from it, but they did it because they're driven by scarcity um, hunting is difficult so it, 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 it's kind of it, it is the issue we, we've now moved into the environment where 85 percent or 80 percent of some people is coming from that mm-hmm. uh, we achieve society in that context you know and processed carbohydrate too you know it's right. not That's it's not like it's all cal- coming from salads and green vegetables either and you know it's Absolutely. coming from all these foods and these packets absolutely that, that's that's right so an opportunity to eat is kind of an opportunity to nourish your body in that kind of mm. thing. Um, but for us, an opportunity to eat is a social event or uh, number two, just a mindless event. So, or, or, or a treat or a reward because the, right. boss, the boss was mean to us today, so he'll be less mean if I have some chocolate and wine or something, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, we've got to kind of start challenging these social norms or or just accept disease. Um, we just mm. normalize it and treat it. And, you know, families, mm. they're just, everything is rising exponentially, you know, from, from mm. autoimmune disease to obesity to diabetes to then uh, new diseases like drop in, drop in hormones uh, such as testosterone, you know, rising infertility mm. rates, um, issues related to, um, um, you know, uh, essentially, you know, uh, there's controversial issues, but, but we're, we're, we're facing a species which kind of is really no longer able to recognize it for what it was 50, 60 years ago. And we live in this politically charged environment, which, um, you know, is it's a really funny place to live, funny, funny times to live in. Mm, uh, mm. And I think I recognize that. It sounds like you do too as well, Susan. Mm, yeah, definitely. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about things like cancer. Um, bowel cancer and and you know in re- in regard to diet because we keep hearing about meat you know don't eat meat meat will increase your risk of colon cancer I'd really like to hear your take on that this will be something you know quite a lot about I imagine yeah I see too much of it unfortunately sadly and I see it in younger and younger patients um look yeah Cancer is probably, and I think there's, again, brilliant papers written about this, cancer is probably also a metabolic uh, condition. It's, um, it's, I talked about free radical generation from dysfunctional mitochondria. You know, free radicals do all sorts of damage to DNA. Um, and, 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 I think, and I think it all comes back down to mitochondrial health. I think cancer is a metabolic illness. Of course, there is genetic nuances and, and life and so forth, but 
um, I think mitochondrial health is critical in that. So when people talk about red meat causes cancer, well, I don't think it does. I think excess calories and obesity and metabolic syndrome probably are closely linked to it, colorectal cancer. Um, some of the studies done on red meat linking it to cancer were um, kind of put together by a, a group called the IRAC, which is a sort of a branch of the um, World Health Organization. And um, in 2000, and I think it was about 2015, they sat down and put together some very flawed analysis of the data, uh, which is primarily based on epidemiological data, which is, as we know, very weak data. They taught randomized control trials, which showed that, you know, there wasn't a really link between problems and, and, and cancer, uh, bowel cancer in particular, and, and focused on these really, you know, poor quality studies, and they concluded risk if they drew a, a, a risk out, which said, well, if you're consuming processed meat, your risk of developing bowel cancer is 1.18 times more, uh, which of course works out to be 18% more uh, based on very flawed data, um, you know, and, and somehow extrapolated that processed meat risk to red meat, you know, um, and said, oh, red meat by default must also be bad. Um, so there's just so many flaws with those guidelines. So when people say red meat causes cancer, I say, no, it probably doesn't, I think excess calories is probably more to blame uh, for that, driven by poor satiety, overeating, and eating chronically through the course of the day. Yeah. What you're eating that red meat with the burger bun and the... Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know. Meat mother's pizza is very different to a grass mm -hmm. steak. Right? Yeah. 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 No, well, I've talked a lot about epidemiological studies and, you know, the fact that association this and causation for a start but also the really poor evidence that they provide yeah absolutely 100 percent, and that's right so if you're a type of individual who's consuming processed meat in an era where we've been told that red meat's you know pretty much evil and the basis of all disease well you, you're probably a type of individual that's less likely to exercise more likely to smoke more likely to be overweight and have poor health risk behaviors anyway um, you know and so, again, it just goes back to the type of individuals that they looked at probably were problematic. You know, they weren't looking at fit and healthy individuals consuming good quality protein sources. So we've also got other myths about protein and disease. So we've got, you know, kidney disease, osteoporosis. Yeah. Um, acid alkaline balance, which you touched on a little bit earlier about the pH of our stomach. Um, again, is it, in your opinion, the same sort of issues apply as yeah, they do to the cancer? It will be well and truly disproven. So the fact that excess protein causes kidney failure is rubbish. We know those with impaired kidney function have difficulties in buffering and excreting um, nitrogen, which is a byproduct of protein metabolism. That's a different story. A lot of these kidney diseases are driven by metabolic syndrome or diabetes in any case. So yes, in those individuals, um, perhaps they might have difficulties with higher protein loads, um, but that's a very different story to excess protein causing a kidney disease. That has been well, truly disproven. Mm. The fact that excess protein causes osteoporosis, is, that, that theory is just pure rubbish. I mean, what they were doing was essentially testing people with high protein diets and seeing that calcium was excessively excreted in their urine. And they concluded, well, they must be melting it from their bones and releasing it in the circulation, but they failed to take into account that people were basically excreting the excess calcium because basically these proteins were tend to be very rich in calcium, mm. essentially excreting what they were um, eating. They weren't mobilizing it from the bone. In fact, I'd say a low protein diet is probably far more likely to be linked to osteoporosis and high protein diet. There's good data that vegan bones um, tend to struggle more or they tend to develop more osteoporotic disease than do um, the people that consume meat. Mm. Well, I think, I think understanding that protein is the building block for kind of everything in your body and every function in your body is something that I don't see talked about very much we really focus on carbs and fat mm. all the time and it's always this battle am i going to eat high carb or am i going to eat high fat and you said it beautifully a bit earlier on protein needs to be stable whatever you decide high carb or high fat yeah. you've got to keep your protein at the same 
level all the time. That's a non-negotiable. 100%, yeah, that's right. You design on the fuel of choice, whether that's carbohydrate or, or fat. Yeah. Make mm -hmm. sure it is not refined carbohydrate. Make sure it is not refined fat, fat yeah. protein. Yeah, that, that's kind of a no-brainer. You've got to keep it steady. Mm -hmm. Um, the beauty with protein is if you'll consume protein, it generally will bring fat with it. So for me, it's a convenience thing, right? So I can have a very low carbohydrate diet um, because, well, I'm, I'm a you know I'd rather just throw a steak on a barbecue with mm. some eggs and consume that. Yep. There's my protein, there's my fat. Done. Move on. For and the and also all your nutrients. So you're not yeah. just so everyone's clear. You're not missing out on any nutrients by doing that. 100%. That's exactly right. Now, I could choose to do that with carbohydrate. I could have my steak with, with you know, sweet potatoes or potatoes or something like these. But, you know, I'm, I, I inherently worry about mixing fuel types. So, yeah. you know, it's called a random cycle, which is that maybe mm. it uses the mitochondria where I'm consuming a beef with, with fat and then eating sugar with it. So it's kind of delivering two types of fuel to the body. Mm. Um, which I think is problematic. I think you best to choose fuel source. So a lean bit of beef, which is low in in fat, with a carbohydrate source, maybe maybe better. But then you know it's boring to kind of consume that because fat, as you know, uh, does provide some element of pleasure. It makes it more desirable. So uh, it's it's about choosing what you want. You know, some people don't like fat, and so go mm -hmm. for a cut of like protein. You know, go for chicken and um, chicken and broccoli or, or chicken and a sweet potato or potato but but you know it's just about what you desire as well we can we can be a bit more flexible about it and what worries me about going very lean on your fat on your animal fats is they're a really high source of you know vitamins a d e k2 which we don't get in our plant foods or well, we get plenty of e but you know not as many of those other really essential fats uh vitamins that are in that bio available form again which we get from the animal foods so absolutely absolutely there's, there's simply no no argument that that uh, in my mind like this is my personal opinion that the combination of protein fat is what is evolutionary evolutionarily most natural to us you know, and, and there is a problem with, with lean uh, or rabbit starvation where overconsumption of very, very lean proteins is fundamentally not sustainable and uh, probably does lead to protein toxicity, um, you know, um, over, over time because fat is an essential macronutrient and you need to consume it. Um, you know, you, you hear about people um, for movie roles and, or, or for bodybuilding competitions consuming broccoli and lean chicken breast. Mm. They, can't, they can't do it for very long. They get very sick mm. because they drop mm. their body mm. fat percentage as well. So yeah. I kind of just prefer to keep my body happy, uh, my brain happy, because I'm just accustomed to that method mm. as well. It, it's interesting, you, you, your brain simply craves what, what it's used to. So your craving shift with, with whatever you consume every day. And to get into a routine, I think, is actually very protective mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to having too much variety in your diet. You know, I think that can become very confusing for people and overwhelming too. Mm. I want to be respectful of your time, but if you've got time to answer just a couple more questions about... Sure. I, I would like to talk about skin allergies a little bit. This is something I am seeing coming up more and more. and you know, really terrible allergies as well. Do you have any thoughts about that? Some of the people I'm seeing allergies with have gone carnivore and they keep saying they feel like it's the oxalate dumping and things like that. But I just wonder how long oxalate dumping can actually last for. I'd just be interested in your perspective. Yeah, sure. I, I think a lot of this is mediated by the gut, Susan. I think we've got this really dysregulated gut system where, um, you know, we've got the environment outside and then we've got our environment inside. Historically, that's all been separated by a gut that is impermeable. It's, it's a wall. It doesn't let anything in, whereas the modern gut, I suspect, is permeable. It lets these environmental antigens in. So these things that are that we're consuming in our food um, 
I think, you know, we talk of lectins, we talk of oxalates, we talk of, you know, glyphosate, we talk of emulsifiers, all of these stuff that really is kind of, the human gut hasn't known for millions of years. There's this, this is free transfer. So I think what we're seeing is this recruitment of immune cells for the gut. And so not just that these toxic substances can now enter our bloodstream and bind distant organ systems, but we're also seeing this hyper-stimulated immune system. So the immune system really is kind of ready for war, um, if that makes sense. So uh, I think that kind of explains a lot of this um, uh, allergies and autoimmune illnesses, epidemics that we're seeing, it, it has to come back to the leaky intestinal uh, system, I think. Um, and and there, it's a well-established phenomenon that intestinal permeability, um, or what is colloquially known as leaky gut, is probably real. And it can actually be measured you know, by, uh, mm, mm. by some uh, uh, urine tests as well. So it, it's quite an interesting area. But what's known is that as a society moves into being um, more hygienic uh, in an environment where there's much more refined foods, these you'll see an increase in, in, in allergies. What's interesting to note is that Japan, which is probably the, the cleanest or the most hygienic country, I think 60% of their population will suffer allergies of some form or atopic conditions such as eczema, mm. asthma, mm. conditions, you know, um, the environmental um we're designed to be in an environment which is which is highly hostile our environment is no longer that so it's the causes are probably multifactorial but you know i do believe that the gut's somewhere tied into all this so what's your thought about using things like you know probiotics and you know to try and improve our intestinal bacteria i mean do we really know enough about that or do you think it's useful no, I don't think so. I think we would have gained microbial diversity by living in, in environments which were, we're exposed to the soil and, you know, other animals, large animals, um, each other's microbiome. We're, we're exposed to out there in the environment, but, you know, we're now in this modern, ultra-refined, sedentary, you know, environment cooped up, mm. you know, 30 square metre apartments. It's sort of... Um, you know, in addition with this widespread use of antibiotics and all the preservatives and all the other rubbish in food, I think our microbial signature is kind of uh, deteriorated. But I don't think probiotics do anything. I think there is a consensus statement by uh, which was released by the American Journal of Gastroenterology show that it's actually got a very limited scope of use. Has no role in irritable bowel syndrome. Has no role in inflammatory bowel disease. There is just no evidence to suggest that it works. But it's an all five billion dollar industry. And capitalism trumps um, mm. sense in this modern mm. world. So, you know, from a science-based perspective, I don't prescribe probiotics to anyone um, because I don't think they work. And that's clinically, from my experience, but also what the um, what our what our premier journal in gastroenterology has uh, stated, based on expert opinion. So, how would people go about improving? Their leaky gut, you know, how would they how would they reduce that? What could they do, and how long would it take to resolve? Million dollar question, Susan. This is a very very difficult um, question to answer. It's something that I don't think I've got the answer to. However, what we do know, uh, based on some studies, um, you know, is that that we think excessive fructose is probably toxic for the gut cells because it causes right. a depletion and probably. Yeah you know, damages the gut lining and the barriers, opens up the barriers as we spoke about. We think emulsifiers are involved, we think alcohol is involved. We don't know the role of glyphosate, but I think um, that must be tied in somewhere. Um, and and uh, of course, sugar-based toxicity. Mm. Uh, sugar in the modern world is 50% fructose, and I think fructose is a big, big player in all of this. Mm. And I think our diet's are extremely rich in fructose. I'm not talking about fruits because uh, mm. fruit generally, whilst they contain fructose, it's all locked in within a fibrous matrix, which makes it very difficult to absorb it. Um, but again, our fruits, modern day fruits are now bred for taste of fructose, such a sweet molecule, much yeah. quicker than glucose or, um, or, or uh, any of the other type of sugars that, that our fruits are now being selected for with a higher fructose content. You know, mm. and you just need to look at our fruits to know that they're not the same fruits from 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Indeed, 
50 years ago. Um, yeah. being select yeah. or by the taste and durability on a store shelf. So uh, it, it, how do we fix leaky gut is very difficult to do, Susan, when the entire environment is stacked against you. You know what I mean? So, um, um, you know, my personal approach to it is that, that I eat a diet which is rich in animal protein where they're consuming what they're supposed to eat and yeah. I get my energy from fat. Fat generally will tend to raise blood ketones um, and we think beta-hydroxybutyrate might be the fuel of choice for the gut. So I keep my gut well fueled. Yeah. Uh, my fuel of choice is fat and mm -hmm. um, you know, and quality amino acids with the micronutrients and cross my fingers and hope that, that I don't have a leaky gut. And um, you know, and I think this is all that people can generally do. It's there's no science to say there's a magic pill to cure it, certainly taking no external supplements are likely to uh, help with that. What about the role of fiber in our diet? Sorry, I keep coming up with these other things I need to I need to get I need to ask you about or I'd love for people to hear your opinion about we keep hearing you know we must have fiber in our diet yeah no um look I think a high fiber diet is far superior to a standard western diet there's no doubt about that so someone who's whole food plant-based who's avoiding the refined rubbish um, that the modern world provides is going to be so much better than someone who's eating consuming a standard Australian or standard New Zealand or standard American diet. Um, I think we would both, ag uh, you know, agree on that point that, that, you know, this is why a lot of the data shows that plant-based diets may be beneficial. Of course, it, this is what has been consumed here is just, it's Frankenstein food. Mm -hmm. it's, it's terrible stuff. Now, mm -hmm. but my question is how do we optimize optimized function right and so if fiber can be utilized by our high gut uh, colon to produce butyrate which is a cousin molecule of beta hydroxybutyrate mm -hmm. so essentially what the human body is trying to do and this is a very elegant way to look at it is it's utilizing the fiber to ferment it utilizing the bacteria that is in our hind gut to provide our colon or our body with butyrate but we can release beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a breakdown tissue, uh, which is a breakdown um, uh, of our adipose tissue, which is which is we can release that in a hundred, you know, ten to fifteen times or uh, more than than we can with butyrate. So it's quite interesting when you look at it that way. Plus, we know that excessive amounts of fiber, if they're fermented, can release methane, hydrogen, and nitrogen to gas, which cause intestinal distension, which can indeed cause issues related to motility, bloating, gut distress. So um, this, the, the, the data on fiber is mixed with regards to it being beneficial for gut. There's no doubt it's better than a standard Western mm -hmm. diet. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know that in children who are constipated who have gut issues, adding in fiber does nothing. In fact, mm -hmm. it give them the opposite. And we find that anecdotally in our practice as well. In fact, there is scattering of randomized control trials, or one in particular, which showed that a zero fiber diet actually helped alleviate constipation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, until you can get a properly uh, powered study, which is looking specifically at that question, um, um, you know, uh, of is a high fiber diet better than a zero fiber diet, where all the macronutrients are adequately distributed, I think it'll be a very difficult question to answer. But personally, I'm not advising anyone does this. My diet's extremely low in fiber, you know, and I kind of don't suffer any, uh, any, any ill effects from it. You know. mm -hmm. And I think your point, Rick, is one that, you know, most of us in the space are trying to emphasize is that any diet that moves you away from that standard Western diet yeah. you're going to see benefit and it doesn't matter if you go vegan vegetarian or whether you move more to a more carnivore based diet you're going to see benefits uh, uh, because absolutely. you're eating real food you're not eating this processed crap garbage that is out there that's exactly right exactly mm. right people should have the flexibility to do it and look if you mm. do a vegan vegetarian diet just do so cautiously with, with under the guidance of you know someone who's trained to do it where to make sure that you're receiving adequate macronutrients uh, and micronutrients mm -hmm. so you don't run into any nutritional deficiencies which is very mm -hmm. likely i think it's important that that we don't push the vegan diet or vegetarian uh, 
vegan diet in particular on children where they've got really high nutritional requirements and a developing brain and might not be all that healthy for them. In fact, there's data emerging that, in fact, it might be mm -hmm. uh, associated with adverse outcomes. Um, so, you know, there's a way to optimise, there's a way to really live well, optim optimal health, and there's a way to just survive, and there's a way to mm -hmm. get sick. So this is where mm -hmm. I come class, you know, the standard Western diet, your whole food, plant-based diet, and then there's a diet that, might be more optimal for us and uh, probably more. Then there's the, thri the thriving diet. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly right. It's, uh, yeah. it's up to the individual to choose, but I think all we can do is uh, educate. Can I just ask you a bit about gastric surgeries? I don't know a lot about it myself, but I do have a lot of clients who have either had them or are thinking about having them for, you know, weight loss, basically. What's your thoughts? What are, what's the pros and cons? Well, you do see rapid weight loss, but there's a good amount of data to suggest that unless, unless the underlying issue, which is fixed, which is essentially could be emotional, could be a lack of satiety, that a lot of people will end up in the same position despite having their gastric sleeve or bypass surgery. Um, so that, that that's a worrying statistic um, because you know having gastric sleeve surgery can certainly reduce your ability to absorb uh, certain things such as B12 and iron and so forth, and it affects your ability to enjoy food as well because people mm. become full very quickly. So I'm not sure that cutting out what is a critical organ or reducing it in size kind of addresses the fundamental issue. Of course, if you're looking for rapid weight loss and you know to kind of speed you up in your journey, yes, there is there is that option. But um, I would certainly trial protein leverage and. Uh, mm resistance training to build up muscle and try the natural one you know um, rather than straight away jumping to to surgery um, but yeah. that's my personal opinion yeah. and i think to be honest i think it's a sensible one mm. and i suppose the fact that the weight loss occurs so rapidly and that type 2 diabetes is reversed so quickly does point to the dietary influence of those problems as well, too many calories and too many of the wrong sort of calories. So, you know, perhaps you can do it without, you know, if you can get rid of those those foods, perhaps you can do it without the surgery. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think people should be given that option, whereas mm. often preoperatively before these bariatric surgeries, they're placed on very low calorie diets, which are 800 calorie diets, 800 calories or 1200 calories, which we know from the starvation experiments carried out by Ansel Keys in the 50s on conscientious objectors mm -hmm. to all that, that these things fundamentally lead to disordered eating. Um, and essentially, you know, if you're providing them with 1200 calories, which are very nutrient poor, um, these people cannot sustain this for very long. Mm -hmm. So when they come back and they've relapsed with the eating style and they've been able to adhere to it, low calorie diet well the option that's painted as well you've failed so mm -hmm. you go, here's your gastric sleeve but the reality is there are days as an active 40 year old you know, uh, 40 year old male um, who does a lot of a fair bit of resistance training that i get through on 800 calories except 800 calories come come from huge sea bones and eggs and mm -hmm. those yeah. are providing my body satiety and nutrients so this is the thing, you know, calories, um, you've got to question the quality of calories. So mm. they say that if these low calorie diets that were instituted prior to the bariatric surgery being con considered as a trial, which is done by the in-house dietitians, if they were given the right macronutrient distribution with quality proteins, it would be a very different story. A lot of these patients will see long-term weight loss, which would be sustainable for them. Mm. Like you said in the beginning, we've got to come back to a lot about what's going on in our heads, our thoughts, our beliefs about food. Um, you know, so it's it's quite complex. It's the solution is simple, but it's not easy to do. No, not in this modern environment. No, no, it's really difficult. No. So, kind of come to the end. But I would like to just ask about feeding our children because this is why I kind of really got out into becoming more public in this space because the statistics in New Zealand appall me with 
the health of our children, the increasing rates of type 2 diabetes, the amount of obesity. And I feel like we're just stealing the lives of our kids and we're stealing their potential by setting them up with all these health issues. So just anything you could say or any thoughts you would have for parents or grandparents? Yeah, I think, you know, your children are energy hungry. Their brains are developing. They're geared by instinct to seek out energy um, and providing them with these treats, cakes and biscuits and a chronic source of poor quality energy, which they crave because it kind of makes us feel good to see them enjoy it. Um, it's fundamentally flawed, um, you know, and, um, and I try to explain this to my mother, you know, when I'm, when I'm uh, but, but, but I understand why grandparents and parents seek to give them this, but, the children are simply driven by an energy hunger. These things, their brains are developing so rapidly that it's calling for energy. That's why you, you, you see these deep addictive um, traits starting to emerge in these kids because we know that, that sugar is deeply addictive, uh, but their brains are calling for this. And I don't think it's particularly healthy type of energy because the, the micronutrient value in that probably is very poor. Satiety value, very poor. So um, yeah, we're seeing huge surges of, of obesity in children. And, and I think in the next 10 to 20 years, as these obese children develop into obese adults, which is inevitably what the uh, outcome will be, we'll see a, a rapid surge in requirement for liver transplants as a lot of these children will start developing uh, end-stage liver disease um, due to cirrhosis uh, from fatty liver. Um, we'll see a huge surge in you know, 20 and 30 year olds with all sorts of cancers, we'll see autoimmunity, we'll see mental health issues. Um, you know, the future is really quite bleak. And, um, you know, and I, I think unless one is deeply tuned in to what is occurring, um, I think it is very, very difficult. I think with my kids, of course, they enjoy, you know, physical cakes and nothing, yep. but try to emphasize as much quality protein, in particular beef. Um, you know, and, and try and definitely push that at least once or twice a day. You know, mm. um, you know mm. thank you for a wife who supports my way of thinking. We do spoil them a bit, and but we try and make their treats fruits rather than refined stuff. You know, uh, and I think these these are all very very important things uh, to consider. Mm. And it's not the main part of their meals, you know. It's it's a treat, which is, is something rare and special, or you know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think trying to break through into people's mindsets, you know, when I talk to people about our obesity epidemic and our chronic health problems, and everyone seems to think it's somebody else. They go, "Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? You know, what are we going to do about it? It's like it's not my tummy that's." sitting out here in front of me it's everybody else yeah yeah absolutely absolutely it, um, I think as a society we've also become conditioned to what the new norm is so mm. it, um, you know to see someone who's overweight it's kind of it's not unusual anymore in fact mm. the vast majority and, and, and in addition you've got this whole push to normalize a beast as well you can be a beast and normal the real overweight and normal the reality is it's very unlikely that the person who's carrying that level of weight is in fact healthy, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. um, this is the madness of society that we exist in. Uh, you know, I think, I think we're really seeking to now normalise disease. Um, mm -hmm. We have a normalised cancer, so why are we seeking to normalise obesity? I think that's a very flawed um, aspect of, of, of um, this modern world. Mm. Very well said. I understand the concerns about fat shaming, you know, but on the other hand, I think, you know, just what you said about normalizing it is, is kind of like a spiral, a spiral downwards that does lead to a bleak future, unfortunately. Absolutely, absolutely. So over here, I know my clients and a lot of people have real struggles talking to their doctors about this stuff. And their doctors kind of poo poo it. Their doctors aren't really interested. They say nutrition doesn't really make much difference. Have you got any words for how people can talk to their doctors about this? Um, I think you live in a digital age where you can do your research on doctors and I think seek out a doctor that understands nutrition because. Um, 
Now, of course, nutrition plays a huge role, and I think any doctor that, that states that is um, is kind of doing their patients a disservice. We um, we know physician obesity rates in Australia are enormous. You know, sixty percent uh, probably overweight and or obese and or obese. So it's like, well, how can the people that are kind of there to lead you into good health um, do that if they themselves are diseased? of them tend to drink too much alcohol some of them smoke um, you just need to attend a conference where there's doctors and nurses to know what they eat uh, there's extremely poor i don't think we've got a good handle on nutrition i think we need to do more probably at a grassroots level within medical schools to improve nutritional um, uh, teaching uh, and, and teach mm -hmm. medical students nutrition but again nutritional teaching based on guidelines and guidelines I think are flawed so we're just kind of regurgitating flawed information so mm -hmm. it's worrying it, it really is worrying and I think people have a faith in their doctor especially um, uh, you know um, uh, the older generation but the reality is what I'm trying to what I'm seeing is that the newer generation are far more suspicious of their medical um, mm -hmm. medical personnel and, 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 and they they kind of echo that sentiment that these people probably don't know how to teach you to be healthy. Um, so, which is which is sad. I think I think mm -hmm. we, we as a as a profession uh, probably I, I don't think we're held in the same regard as we were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's a, mm -hmm. there's less respect, which is which is fine. I think we we kind of led ourselves into this mess. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a bit of fear there as well. What I see, some of the pushback from GPs over here is there's a little bit of fear of having the authority questioned and, yeah, yeah. you know. 100%. 100%. You know, it, it's irony um, when, when, when I turn up to a meeting designed for to discuss fatty liver amongst 10 gastroenterologists who, who, you know, who are experts on this and we've got professors of, gastroenterology and hepatology there and um, I look around me and, and eight out of ten are metabolically probably unwell and carry excess visceral fats and you know some are frankly obese and these are these are the experts on on fatty liver which is mm. fundamentally yes as it's due to genetic nuances but it's fundamentally an environmentally driven disease so mm. a lot of my thoughts are, are kind of silenced very quickly or, or deeply opposed but the reality is um I um, I've made an effort to understand nutrition and health far more than some of these individuals have. They're, they're, they're kind of stuck within in their ways, and I don't blame them to some degree because the nutritional research is just not there. You know, these journals make mention of many many drugs that can be potentially utilised, and all these fancy mm. things in bariatric surgery. Nutrition is considered a very distant second to these. Um, therapeutic intervention and why it simply doesn't make money you know um mm. where, where's the money um in in teaching person how to eat a good diet it's just not there so again capitalism and uh, healthcare um uh, not a great combination mm. and there's a lot of peer pressure i i've seen on linkedin with you know doctors similar to yourself who are questioning the status quo and speaking out and I've seen some of the feedback they get from, you know, their peers. Yes. And, you know, they basically get told, hey, you know, those people are just a bunch of, you know, crazies and step in line, stay with the fold, you know, don't don't step out of step out of line, which I think is um, quite sad, but yeah. interesting, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I think so. So look, it's quite uh, challenging. It is. Lucky for me, I've um, never been one to kind of follow blindly. I, I tip a question, and um, you know, I think the, yeah, the, there is there is something for the Kuhn hypothesis, which is that you know, which is that essentially these sort of new emerging thoughts are questioned and ridiculed and kind of laughed at, but eventually there is a major shift um, mm. in the way. Uh, paradigms are approached or the, 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 the approach to a problem and, and then that becomes a new norm and, and so that cycle goes on. So I'm hopeful things change, but, um, you know, gee, the, the odds are definitely stacked against us mm. of, um, of where it all goes. I hope I don't appear too cynical there. <laughs> 
I really, really appreciate your time. I'm, I want to do, uh, I want, uh, I want to hear about where people can find you in a moment, but I just wanted to do a little plug because the way we got connected was through a little paper I wrote about a handy guide to protein. And I was really pleased that you had a very positive response to that. And that is a free resource I have on my website for absolutely everybody to go and have a look at and use and try and learn a little bit more about protein. And I'd just appreciate a couple of comments you've got about that. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was a brilliantly written um, piece, actually. I, I think uh, a lot of what I've spoken about was was kind of echoed in that. And, and I think we, we're on the same page when it comes to the importance of protein, the quality of the protein, where the actual protein comes from, because protein obviously can come from many, many sources. But I think it was a brilliantly written resource uh, for your viewers and listeners. Uh, and, and, and I hope that uh, New Zealand... Um, kind of embraces that and works that in as part of the approach to um, to this health epidemic that we're seeing. Um, so, you know, keep up the good work, Susan, with regards to that. And, um, you know, look, I'm happy to to talk about that in future and, and obviously discuss any, any further um, developments as, as they come on because science is rapidly changing. Yeah, absolutely. And there's new research coming on all the time. So... Uh, but I think you've done a great job there and recommend your efforts. Thank you very much. So would you just tell everybody where they can find you? And we'll make sure we put that in social media. I know you're fairly active on... Um, mainly, mainly Instagram, is it? Instagram, yeah, you're fairly I, active. I, I like Instagram, Susan. Um, not to kind of post stories about my life or myself but just it's just a visual medium mm. and I just find that people respond really quickly to a visual medium so mm. other than um, other other sources like Facebook or Twitter but I, but my uh, address or handle is dr underscore pran underscore yoga Nathan um, so this is where I tend to be most active it links into Facebook and Twitter as well so um, yeah um, and you know I write a few blogs on my website you know it, uh, it's under the Centre for Gastrointestinal Health, um, which is a, which is the name of my practice. Great. We'll make sure we get those links shared out there. I, after I came across your work, I have been sharing some of it because you have a great sense of humour and I really love some of your graphics and things. So I try and share them as much as I can with people. Oh, thank you, Susan. It's uh, mainly kind of just taking, taking, the, taking the mickey out of the the healthcare industry, isn't it? It's sort of that, uh, it's that ridiculous sometimes our approach to things. So um, yeah, look, I, I think unless it's humorous, people won't really necessarily sit up and, and, and listen. I'm not particularly a, a, a funny person in real life. I'm not a comedian. I, my wife would say I'm a very serious, intense sort of personality, but it's just, well, how do you, how do you grab some of the attention? Mm -hmm. I've got to kind of engage what the audience wants. And hopefully in that, bit of humor pass on some uh, semblance of a message uh, but I, I do tend to get, get carried away with uh, the, uh, the the memes I suppose. <laughs> oh I love them that they're a lot of fun and they really drive home the message. Brian thank you so much for giving up your time today this has been fantastic and I'm sure everybody will really enjoy it and yeah maybe we can talk again another time. Absolutely. Love to do it again, Susan. And uh, again, as I said, it's very nice to, uh, to, to hear that New Zealand accent. I don't hear it enough. And, um, you know, I've lost mine, unfortunately. But uh, lovely to chat to you and I'm, I'm happy to do it again sometime.